Welcome to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Allison Lawrence and I'm a pediatric dietitian as well as a certified nutrition support clinician in Southern California. And our goal for this foundational series is to really provide you with the fundamental assessment tools that are needed for pediatrics and we'll then be able to take them and utilize them to build pediatric nutrition support prescriptions. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking all about how to estimate pediatric nutritional needs, looking at fluid, energy, as well as protein needs. So first we'll begin with discussing our fluid needs. So fluid needs in pediatrics are primarily done with utilizing the holiday seeger. So the holiday seeger was actually originally created for use in the adult patient population and has since been adopted by pediatric nephrologists for use in the pediatric patient population in 1957. And so this is a weight-based equation. It is a milliliter per kilogram weight-based equation that we utilize in order to estimate the fluid needs for these patients. So they're generally divided into three different categories. We have those for patients that are less than 10 kilos. So we utilize 100 ml for each kilogram for these patients. We then have patients that are between 10 through 20 kilograms and we utilize 1000 ml for those first 10 kilos and then add an additional 50 ml for each kilogram that's above 10 kilos. And then we have our patients that are greater than 20 kilos. So for these patients, we utilize 1500 ml for those first 20 kilos and add an additional 20 ml for each kilogram that's greater than those 20 kilos. So now we're gonna take that and put it into an example. So patient A weighs 34 kilos and we are gonna estimate their fluid needs using the holiday seeker. So for those first 20 kilograms, I know that we're gonna include 1500 ml of fluid for those kilograms. So I'm gonna subtract them out. So I'll take 34 kilos, subtract those 20, and I get a remainder of 14 kilograms that I need to account for. I'll then take those 14 kilograms and multiply them by 20, and that gives me an additional 280 mLs of fluid that I need to account for. I'll then add it to the 1500 mLs that we took for those first 20 kilos, and I get a total of 1780 mLs of fluid that's needed to provide minimal fluid maintenance for this patient. Now, when it comes to energy needs in pediatric patients, our total energy expenditure is generally gonna be divided into four different components. So we have our BEE or our basal energy expenditure, and this is gonna be the energy that's needed for the essential and fundamental metabolic reactions that occur within the body. So this is gonna constitute the majority of our energy needs. We have the thermal effect of food. So this is gonna be the energy that's needed to be able to occur for metabolic reactions, and that counts about five to 10% of our total energy expenditure. We have our physical activity, which of course is gonna depend on the physical activeness of the patient. And then specific to pediatrics, we have the energy cost of growth. So this is really going to be patient dependent. It's going to depend on whether you have an infant that might have a higher energy cost of growth versus an adolescent or an adult that someone that's transitioning into adulthood is going to have a lower energy cost of growth. So that's where pediatrics is a little bit more challenging as we have our, we're coupled with the factor of trying to get our children to grow while there also might be in an acute critically ill situation. So first we'll begin with discussing how to estimate energy needs for healthy patient populations. So there are different energy equations that have been established for use. And keep in mind that some of these are actually gonna be extrapolated in for use in the inpatient clinical setting as well. So first we'll begin with the RDA. The RDA is the recommended dietary allowance. And this equation was actually first created in 1941 and had periodic subsequent revisions up until 1989, which was the last revision. So although we haven't had any recent revisions to the RDA equation, and it might be a little bit dated, some clinicians do still utilize this within clinical practice. And so this was actually obtained from averaging the intakes of children from longitudinal growth studies. And this can tend to overestimate energy needs. So you might see this utilized in the outpatient setting if dietitians are looking to get a quick and rough estimate for what their patient might need as a basic, basic nutrition needs. And then you also might see it utilized on the inpatient setting if we have an infant that's admitted and there might be in an acute illness phase. And so they need a little bit of a higher nutritional provision. So you might see it utilized within that. But it is a kcal per kilogram weight-based equation and there's also grams per kilogram per day of protein that have been identified. The next equation that we have is our DRI and this is our dietary reference intake. So this first began the creation process in 1993, shortly following those end of the revisions of the RDA in 1989. 
And the DRI was created off of studies that looked at total energy expenditure estimations from doubly labeled water consumption and looked at really what is considered to be one of the gold standards for how to evaluate estimated energy expenditure through the analysis of oxygen and hydrogen isotopes within the urine. And so this equation utilizes the patient's weight, utilizes their height, their age, their sex, as well as their physical activity factor. And it, these also include grams per kilogram per day of protein provisions as well. So the DRI, well, although it's designed for use in healthy patient populations, you might also see utilized in the inpatient clinical setting with the addition of any stress factors or activity factors to account for what is going on with the patient. Our next equation that we have is our CATF growth equation. So this equation is really designed for the underweight patient or the malnourished patient that might need to have a little bit of a higher nutritional provision in order to achieve what we call CATF growth. So this equation utilizes the patient's ideal body weight. You can imagine that if you have a patient that is underweight or malnourished, their ideal body weight is going to be higher than their current weight. So we utilize the ideal body weight within the equation that you're choosing to use, whether that be the RDA or the DRI, and that's going to give you the amount of energy, and then you can also use it for protein too, that'll be needed for your patient in order to achieve that catch-up rate of weight gain. So in summary, for healthy patient populations, the DRI is appropriate to use and is most commonly used within practice. Catch-up growth equations should be used for patients who are malnourished or below their expected rate of weight gain, and they have higher nutritional needs. The next patient population we'll talk about is our critically ill patient population. So similar to adult patients, our gold standard, of course, is going to be the indirect calorimetry. So the indirect calorimetry measures the amount of oxygen consumed in relation to the amount of carbon dioxide that's expired, and it gives us our percentage of resting energy expenditure. So we can utilize this energy estimation in order to create a nutrition prescription for our patient that is critically ill. So this is one of the gold standards for determining our resting energy expenditure in these patients, and it does require continual re-measurement. So if we take an indirect calorimetry measurement at one week and we're continuing to use it for weeks on end, it's not appropriate to do that because it is one specific measurement at one specific time point. And we know that in critical illness, we have you know, the acute early phase of critical illness and the late rehabilitation phase, and the energy needs in those two different phases are going to be really different. So if we're unable to obtain repeated measurements of indirect calorimetry, it's important that we remember to default back to the use of a predictive base equation if we're unable to get a new measurement. So literature has defined two different equations for pediatric critically ill patients that are appropriate for estimating their energy needs. Uh, the first equation that we'll talk about is the World Health Organization equation. So this equation was actually created for use in healthy patient populations and has since been adapted for use in the critically ill setting. And this equation is going to measure our resting energy expenditure. So it is a weight-based equation where we plug in the patient's weight and we get our energy estimation. Our next equation is going to be our Schofield equation. So the Schofield equation measures the BMR or the basal metabolic rate of our patient. And this equation utilizes both the weight as well as the height from the patient. And keep in mind that when you're using either WHO or Schofield, you are using these without the addition of any activity factors. We also have protein estimations for these patients that have been established by Aspen. So similar to the Aspen adult critically ill recommendations, there are also Aspen pediatric critically ill recommendations that have been published. So they do have estimations for protein and they are divided into three different age categories. We have our zero to two years of old where we aim to provide two to three grams per kilogram per day. We have patients between the ages of two through 13 where we provide a 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram per day, and then patients that are greater than 13, we aim to provide 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. And for patients that might be on CRRT or continuous renal replacement therapy, we do aim to provide a minimum of 2.5 grams per kilogram per day. So in summary, for critically ill patient populations, of course, our gold standard is going to be that indirect calorimetry, but unfortunately, many facilities don't have access to one. So in that situation, you would want to utilize either Schofield if you had an accurate weight or height, or utilizing the WHO equation or the World Health Organization equation. There are also different predictive base equations that have been established for those with developmental disabilities. So these equations have been established for use for Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, and Prader-Willi. And a lot of these equations are kcal per centimeter of height estimations. 
So there are limitations to using these, including the fact that sometimes we're not able to get accurate height measurements on the majority of these patients. We might be obtaining their height measurements with a knee caliper. Accurateness of them will be dependent on the user and if they have been properly trained or not. And then also some of these have limitations, including the age ranges that they're recommended for use. So they can be helpful to establish an initial estimation, but will need to be continued to be adjusted on the basis of the weight trends of your patient. And just a special note for patients that come into the hospital that are on enteral nutrition support prescriptions at home, their home regimen is going to serve as a great baseline for your energy estimations. So if I have a patient that comes into the hospital and they're on a G-tube regimen and they're growing really well, I'm not going to change anything. I'm going to keep their energy needs as what is estimated from what their nutrition support prescription provides them, and I'm not going to change anything. So if I have a patient that comes in too that is underweight or overweight, I can utilize their home nutrition support prescription and provide caloric increases or decreases, but I'm still using what their home regimen provides as my baseline. So with all of that information, we'll now move into a case study where we can apply some of these concepts that we've learned. So you are the dietitian who is working on call for Yellow Rainbow Hospital, which is a pediatric hospital with a level one trauma center. You get a page regarding a newly intubated patient within the PICU. AB is a previously healthy four-year-old female who was admitted to the PICU following an MBA, resulting in extensive injuries, and the patient has been intubated for airway protection. Anthropometric measurements are as follows. So she weighs 16 kilograms, which puts her at the 51st percentile with a Z-score of 0.02. Her height is 101 centimeters, which plots her at the 47th percentile with a z-score of negative 0.07, and her BMI plots at the 63rd percentile, which gives her a z-score of 0.32. Upon reviewing her growth chart, you note that she has been following her trend correctly, and mom reports no concerns as far as weight gain goes or any nutritional concerns. You complete a nutrition-focused physical examination and note that she appears well-nourished with having good stores of both subcutaneous fat as well as muscle mass. And so we are going to estimate AB's nutritional needs. So first, beginning with fluid, we're going to take 1,000 mLs for those first 10 kilos and add an additional 50 mLs for every kilogram above 10, which in AB's case is 6 kilos. So we'll get a total of 1,300 mLs of fluid that would be providing her with maintenance fluid needs. For energy needs, unfortunately, we don't have access to interact calorimetry at the Yellow Rainbow Hospital, so we are going to utilize the Schofield equation. So we plug in the patient's weight as well as her height, and we get a total of 806 calories per day. And for protein needs, we're going to utilize the Aspen recommendations, so we'll provide 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram per day, which puts her at 24 to 32 grams per day. So in summary, when you're estimating energy needs, it's important to remember that it is just that, it is an estimation. So unfortunately, we know that a lot of the times our predicted base equations might be a little bit inaccurate. So it's important that you make sure that you're assessing your patient, you're assessing their rates of weight gain, their growth and development, and making adjustments as would be needed. And remember to use your clinical judgment to make a well-informed evidence-based decision. I hope you enjoyed today's video and please feel free to leave any questions or comments down in the comments below and we will have our references within the description box as well. Mm -hmm.